Yo, this is Raheem from the legendary Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five with my brother Mark on Impact Global News. Though I was born in turbulent times, I promised self there would never be an obstacle more virtuous than I. No external force could ever alter my course or alter my motion. I attribute that all to my coaching. One man is an island, but he's surrounded by ocean. Keep harpoons ready when them sharks approach him. Detractors throwing wrenches in hopes they would propel him to his former way of living in which he had grown accustomed. I done roared with lions. I done so with eagles, I done scorch with iron, drew swords against evil, and I done wrestle poverty, fist fought with hopeless, detrimental probably, but this course is for soldiers. We're live and direct, this is Impact Global. My name is Mark, aka Sure to the Shot, Black Prophets, with my man Raheem on the set of The Get Down Part 2. <laughs> Raheem was one of the last members to join that great hip-hop group, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. Now, there's no need for me to go into how you got into hip-hop, rapping, and all of that stuff. But as you know, the world is watching the get-down. Now, is it real or is it factual or what? I mean, the dude playing the piano, is that supposed to be Manny Mel? Please, can you explain to us your character and how the story really was for the Furious Five MCs? Well, with the Furious Five, uh, the person um, who... Well, there were two members of the Furious Five that were uh, musically inclined. Um, myself, which I was the one more likely to play, uh, to be the one playing the piano because um, I took, uh, uh, I had a band class in school, um, in junior high school. And, and um, my first instrument that I learned how to play was tenor saxophone. And then, um, and, and I was like the best uh, tenor sax player in my in my class. And then, um, walking through the hallways one day in the school, I found a key uh, on the floor, and um, I had a feeling that it was a key to a classroom door. So I tried every classroom door in the school until I found uh, the the lock that that key fit, and it was a, a classroom classroom and it just so happened to be the piano room so whenever um whenever i would have um gym class and we would be engaging in a sport in gym class that i didn't want to participate in like volleyball i would cut gym class and i would sneak into the piano room uh pull the shades down uh, turn out the lights and lock the door and I would be locked in there uh, by myself in the dark and I taught myself how to play the piano. So why did the writers of the get down include an MC with a piano? I, I'm gonna go out on a limb here because um, you know the get down um, as a result of it not being a biopic or a documentary it's a drama so there are some uh, bits and pieces of of, of factual um, historical data in it, but uh, it's also um, there are many more embellishments. So the main group of actors in the Get Down, who are they supposed to be? The Furious Five or the Funky Four? Uh, the group in the Get Down, the Get Down Brothers, are loosely based on the Furious Five. Okay, Raheem, this is something that's been bugging me. Who wrote the rap lyrics for the lead character called Books in the Get Down? Uh, the lead character, Books, um, a lot of the lyrics that Books uh, recited in the Get Down were written by Nas. Um, Nas, I believe, wrote uh, the majority of the lyric that Books said when he was not performing with the group and all of the lyrics that were said um, that were performed by the group uh, I wrote. Now Raheem I've seen and heard all the mixtapes you know the ones with like the battles of the Cold Crush Brothers, the Fantastic Five MCs and so on but I ain't seen much battles with the Furious Five I mean did they encounter any battles with any of the rap groups back in the day? Uh, yes the Furious Five uh, battled uh, the Funky Four plus one uh, we battled the Fantastic Five um uh yeah we battled we battled a few um a few groups actually 
the Furious Five did not battle the Funky Four because the Funky Four, um, uh, I was a member of the Funky Four. Um, that that was the name of the group when I was a member. The Funky Four Plus One or the Funky Four Plus One More um, is what the name of the group became after I left and joined the Furious Five. Oh my goodness. I was recruited uh, by Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Four um, when Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Four and DJ Breakout, DJ Baron, and the Funky Four uh, battled uh, May 11th, 1979 at the Webster Avenue PAL on 183rd Street and Webster Avenue in the Bronx. And even though Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Four uh, won the battle, uh, they really liked the way that I performed so much that uh, Melly Mel, and uh, at the time his name was Mr. Ness and later changed to Scorpio, uh, they showed up at my mom's house a few days after the battle and um, asked me if I would be interested in joining their group. When the group initially split, how did this affect the band? And what was your view on the whole situation? Uh, when the group split in like 1984, 85 or something like that, um, we, <clears throat> we just banded as a result of... <clears throat> Um, contrasting uh, differences in how we should continue forward if we should um, if we you know some of us wanted to um, stay with Sugar Hill Records and then another you know the other half of us wanted to move forward and leave Sugar Hill Records because we had never uh, gotten paid a royalty of any kind we only um, got advances and um, so we wanted to we wanted to be treated fairly and we didn't feel as though we were okay but well, why was it so um, it was uh, you know divide and conquer um, uh, Sylvia Robinson you know there was there was never any clear cut uh, reason that I could fathom that uh, would have made sense as to why she why she saw the need to you know uh, split the group up and 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 you know work with or just uh, keep one person from the group to <clears throat> to make sure that she took care of. I mean, maybe it was an expense thing and, you know, obviously it's cheaper to care for one person than it is for six. So that, that could have been it. But, you know, um, who knows? Now, the Furious Five's Keith Cowboy, a phenomenal MC. What happened? Tell us a little bit about Keith Cowboy. Uh, Cowboy was um, the, the, you know, the mic controller, the, the crowd um pleaser he he um his call and response um uh techniques with the, you know with the audience he pretty much had the audience eating out of his hand he could you know command them to say something or do something and they said and did exactly what it was he commanded them to do um he passed away in 1989 uh three days before his 28th birthday um no i'm sorry no i'm wrong he passed away in 1989, uh, September the 8th, 1989. And um, uh, his birthday is September 20th, and he would have been 28 years old. And um, uh, he passed away from uh, a virus called meningitis uh, that attacks the fluid in the spine. And from my understanding at the time of his uh, demise, he, um, the, his spinal cord was completely 
uh, void of, of spinal fluid. Raheem, in all the ladies' dreams. Now, how in the hell did you come about making up such a great line? Uh, Raheem, in all the ladies' dreams, basically derived as a result of me trying to find... Uh, you know, slogans to rhyme with the name Raheem. Um, <clears throat> and, and you know, like, not just, you know, slogan, but like a catchy slogan. And it, it kind of stuck. Um, you know, I, I uh, came up with that line as a result of uh, a battle between um, the guy who actually inspired me to become uh, an MC uh, rap artist. And uh, his name is Joe Goodwin. He used to say these these rhymes, uh, kind of like nursery rhymes, and he would walk, walk the halls of our high school, uh, Harry S. Truman High School in the North Bronx uh, in Co-op City. And he would, he would walk around the halls of the school saying these nursery rhymes, and he'd have like every chick in the school following him around. So I was like, you know, I, I need every chick in the school following me around, so I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna write some rhymes and uh, challenge uh, my man Joe to a little battle. Oh man! Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, kind of to this very day. Um, you know, every every woman that I've ever been uh, uh, romantically involved with. Um, you know, finds a reason to throw that uh, that slogan in my face at some point in time. You know, and they say it with such such sarcasm and <laughs> <laughs> Raheem and all the ladies' dreams, oh, huh? Man. You know? And I'm always having to like explain myself or you know just say like, babe, like it's it I. It just rhymes with my name. Like, it's not, it's not that serious. <laughs> like, yeah, whatever. Okay, Raheem, I heard you guys singing on a few tracks. Now, rappers that can sing too is a great skill. Tell me, when did the singing part first come about by the group? Um, yes. Uh, well, when I was with the Funky Four, uh, one, of, one of the things that I brought to the Funky Four was... I would, um, I idolized uh, Michael Jackson and the Jackson 5 uh, growing up. And um, so uh, I, I was the singer of the group. Um, I got my, my singing abilities from my mom. She had a beautiful voice. She sung uh, around the house and everything that she did. And, um, and then um, my singing ability was further developed um, by when I, um, when I met a guy by the name of Raheem LeBlanc. Uh, who was the lead singer of um, an R&B group called GQ. They made um, a song called Disco Nights. And um, so, you know, Raheem and, and GQ would uh, do local block parties around my neighborhood. Uh, and at the time, they were called the Rhythm Makers. And the bass player, uh, Sabu Cryer, rest in peace, uh, he was from the same housing development that I'm from, uh, Lambert Houses. And so um, uh, I would be like right in front of the ropes because they would have uh, the section wherever they would play their music um, whenever their band would be outside in our neighborhood they would have that section roped off and the band would be behind the ropes well I was a little kid and I'd be right in the front of the ropes like practically in Raheem LeBlanc's mouth uh, singing along with him uh, every note and so he saw and heard that and he said he told me one day after their performance I had a good voice and that he would um, he would like to be my vocal instructor so he took me under his wing and taught me uh, some techniques and um, I applied those techniques when I became uh, a member of the Funky Four and I would remix um, old Jackson 5 songs and, and change the words up but use the same 
same melody and um, I would sing um, you know those songs and then you know the group would would rap um, and so I took that same um, technique with me when I left the Funky Four and joined the Furious Five and um, or be, and, and we became the Furious Five. I keep saying I joined the Furious Five. They were not the Furious Five until I became a member uh, because I was the fifth member. Now, Raheem, were you guys actually signed to Brass Records and who were the members under the younger generation? No. Uh, I was never signed to Brass Records. Um, in fact, uh, we uh, recorded the song uh, "We Rap More Mellow," and um, and we were never paid uh, any royalties. Um, in fact, we never saw the person. Uh, by the name of Terry Lewis, not to be confused with the great Terry Lewis from the super uh, talented production team of Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, not that one. Uh, so I'll, I'll just uh, call him the bootleg Terry Lewis. Um, the bootleg Terry Lewis approached us about doing um, doing a song, uh, uh, making a record, and um, he he took us in the studio. Uh, we had a, a local band of some of our friends come into the studio and play, uh, replay uh, an interpolation of Stephanie Mills' song, Put Your Body In It. And uh, we did the vocals and it came out <clears throat> unbeknownst to us. And I, we didn't know that it was actually released until one day I was walking up um, uh through a, a shopping area in the Bronx called Fordham Road. And there was a, a record shop on Fordham Road that had uh, their their speakers outside the store. And so they would, you know, play music and the music was blasting outside the store in the street. And so um, I heard We Rap More Mellow playing. And so I excitedly ran into the record store uh, to see, um, you know, to buy a copy. Uh, and so there was a pretty long line and I got on the back of the line and when, um, and as the line began to get shorter, uh, the song played in its entirety in it, and then it went off. And then um, the proprietor behind the counter uh, played another song. And so by the time I got to the counter to speak with the proprietor, I, um, I asked, you know, if he would um, give me a copy of that song by Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. I'm like, yo, you know, um, that song that was just playing um, <clears throat> by Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. He's like, who? I said, that song that just went off by Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. He's like, that's not the name of the artist who made that song. Damn. I said, okay, um, you want to tell me who the name, what, what the name of the artist that made the song is? And he's like, yeah, sure. And he picks up the record and he looks at it and says, uh, oh, that's by the younger generation. What a shock. I said, let, I said, let me see that. Matter of fact, you know what? Here, I want to buy it. So I bought a copy uh -huh. and uh, I happened to be on my way to rehearsal with the group. And when I got to rehearsal, I showed them the record and um, we knew where the bootleg Terry Lewis lived, um, which was a few blocks from Flash's house at, um, apartment at the time. And so we walked over to uh, Terry Lewis's apartment. Um, and when we, um, when we got to his door, we noticed that the lock cylinder was missing. And so one of the members of the group, Scorpio, uh, inadvertently leaned up against the door and uh, the door uh, flung open and we noticed that uh, there was no one in Terry Lewis's apartment. The furniture was gone and apparently he had moved and we never saw him again. And uh, as far to this very day. Never saw him again, never received a dime of royalties from Brass Records for uh, the recording or sales of We Rap More Mellow. Um, and 
is who's still alive? Terry Lewis. I have no idea. We've never we never seen him again. This was in the 70s. Now here's something that's been bugging me for years, Raheem. Why wasn't the Furious Five in the movie The Wild Style? Um, the Furious Five uh, were actually in the movie Wild Style, but um, when uh, we we had a performance scene uh, at the amphitheater, and um, from my understanding, the scene um, after it was shot and and Charlie Ahern. Um, and and his, I guess, editor uh, looked back at the footage. The footage came out blurry, and so they wanted to reshoot it. But when they wanted to reshoot it, um, the issue was that they didn't want to pay anyone. So um, they they called Sylvia Robinson, uh, the president of our record label at the time, to request. Um, us to shoot that scene again and um, when she told them that it was going to cost them um, they they decided not to reshoot it so that's why the Furious Five was not in Wild Style. Do you have any new songs or collaborations in the pipeline? Um, I am working on a solo project um, that I'm looking to release uh, sometime uh, in 2017, uh, I'm writing a book. Um, I'm working on a screenplay. Uh, the screenplay has nothing to do with hip hop. Um, it's a sci-fi movie, and um, um, I'm pretty excited about it because um, I, I pitched it to a few uh, professionals in the film industry, and they got really excited about it so okay yeah. Raheem here's a tough one what's your thoughts on today's so-called mainstream rappers are they skilled or just pop stars living off the hip-hop culture the irony of this question is that you know uh, there's a world a whole world filled with very very talented musicians uh, that many people don't know and probably never will know um, and unfortunately um, with regards to the music industry there's a whole industry filled with um, filled with a few talented artists and musicians but um, for the most part it's more fluff, it's more, you know, smoking mirrors, and, and there's not uh, that uh, endless resource of talent pool that uh, we're enjoying in today's music culture as we did uh, maybe 30 years ago. Um, you know, when uh, when we had greats like, you know, Michael Jackson, Stevie Wonder, um, you know, uh, Curtis Mayfield, Donny Hathaway, like, you know, there, there were just many, many examples of greatness that we had to look to and draw a wealth of, you know, inspiration from. Uh, and nowadays, um, you know, uh, music culture nowadays um, entertainment at large has become more like fast food and um, you know the the quality of our entertainment nowadays uh, leaves much to be desired um, and I equate um, I equate the level of, of talent or, or excuse me I equate today's music to uh, bad nutrition and um, you know you know when you when you ingest you know healthy food um, you know you're gonna be healthy obviously uh, you know and when you ingest you know food that is not nutritious then eventually your body you know shows you by you know breaking down your immune system and you you become ill um so 
So I equate that same uh, concept, that same concept to intellectual uh, material. Um, um, audio frequencies and visual images are two things that enter a person's subconscious mind without our permission. And so as a result of that, um, you know, uh, if every day of your young impressionable life, all you do is listen to your favorite artist who's probably in your ear more hours a day than your parent and your teacher, and they are telling you uh, verbatim that the road to their success was to stand on the corner and um, and sling packs of dope or cocaine or crack or whatever it was and, you know, excuse my language, shoot niggas and, um, excuse me, uh, have sex with, you know, as many women as you can. Um, that's called the power of suggestion, especially seeing as though um, the people programming the music uh, that we listen to on conventional radio every day, they're called program directors. And they're called that for a very valid reason. They program the music that programs the listener. In your view, Raheem, who is the best hip-hop MC still alive on this earth today and why? That would be very uh, a very difficult, probably next to impossible question to answer um, right at, at this moment because one, to say that somebody is the best at anything, that would mean that you would need to be privy to all of the other people who are in contention, right? Which I am not. I'm not. I'm not privy to uh, the existence of all of the the great MCs. I know the ones that that are known to us because you know through through promotion and marketing. But the ones who aren't known, um, I don't know who they are, and so I don't classify anybody as the greatest anything because to with with the exception of Muhammad Ali. <laughs> 